Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think we're ready to start our panel now. Since the panel is moderated by an Indonesian in typical Indonesian fashion, it's 10 minutes late. <laughs> But I think we're ready to start. Um, so thank you for taking the time to attend uh, our panel today on th threats to freedom of expression in Asia. Uh, my name is Irene Potranto, and I work with the Citizen Lab, a cybersecurity and human rights research lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs, University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. It is my pleasure to moderate this panel today, and I'm joined by five esteemed panelists from Thailand, South Korea, the Philippines, and Malaysia, who will introduce themselves as they begin their presentation on their respective countries. For those of you who are not familiar with the Citizen Lab, I'm just going to give a brief background and introduce our discussion today. Uh, so the Citizen Lab was founded in 2001 by Professor Ryan Liebert at the University of Toronto. And we conduct research on threats to free expression online, such as internet censorship, filtering, and surveillance, as well as targeted digital attacks against civil society groups. Uh, together with the Berkman Center at Harvard University and SecDef Group, uh, based in Ottawa, Canada, we formed the OpenNet Initiative and ran network measurement testing in 77 countries and found that 44 of them, including democratic states, implement some level of content filtering. We continue to do research on censorship and filtering today. Uh, for instance, we have published reports on a company called NetSweeper, which is a, a Canadian company that provides web filtering technology. NetSweeper has stated that its products can be used to block inappropriate content to meet government rules and regulations based on social, religious, or political ideals, end quote. We know that NetSweeper is providing internet surveillance and, te and censorship technology to Pakistan, among other countries. Uh, and in Pakistan, the blocked websites included ones that would be considered blasphemous by the government, as well as sites that featured pornography or political discourse, such as those that discuss separatist efforts in Pakistan's Balochistan region. Our research has also uncovered numerous cases of human rights activists targeted by advanced digital spyware manufactured by Western companies, such as Finn Fisher and Hacking Team. We have found Finn Fisher servers in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Mongolia, and Taiwan, and found Hacking Team's remote control system in South Korea, Malaysia, and Thailand. As Google Susan Pointer noted in the opening plenary, the Internet's global center is moving east and south. And yet some of these countries contain zones of conflict, considered to be failed states or riven by ethno-religious tensions. In addition, many of these countries do not yet have the structures in place to ensure accountability and transparency, which are important to guard against abuses of power. So the reason we convene this panel today is because we would like to continue to monitor, discuss, exchange knowledge, and raise awareness of the threats to free expression online. It is important, especially as governments around the world, and with regard to this discussion, particularly those in Asia, are becoming heavily involved in internet governance, including in establishing domestic level internet controls. So we will start our discussion today in Thailand, followed by South Korea, the Philippines, and Malaysia, and we will return to South Korea again at the end to discuss administrative censorship in particular. Each panelist will have 10 minutes each, followed by a Q&A session. So I'll hand it over to Art from Thailand. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Oh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's kind of morning, right? Uh, I would probably like uh, give you like an idea like what's what uh, has been uh, like uh, what's going on right uh, in, in in the past uh, two years uh, since the uh, the current uh, military government uh, has been uh, in control uh, so uh, just uh, just like briefly like like the uh, historical sort of like background like so in in the uh, 20 uh, uh, 20th of uh, uh, 20th May of 2014, right? Uh, the uh, the army announced the uh, uh, martial law, right? Uh, and then to to uh, and uh, on the next day, all the ISP has been uh, summoned uh, to report themselves, right? And uh, for to to control the social media. And then on the next day, on the 22nd of May 2014. Uh, there was a coup, and then after that, a lot of announcements and orders has been announced. 
by the so-called NCPO National uh, uh, Council for Peace and Order, right? NCPO National Council for Peace and Order. Uh, there's a lot of NCPO announcements and orders, right? Uh, uh, today I will discuss some of them that are related to, uh, directly to media and specifically uh, to the uh, internet uh, filtering and monitoring. Uh, I'm actually trying to find like uh, documents uh, in, in, in English, but like I cannot really, but like, so I'm just going to, can, can you do like this like full screen? I just like give you an idea. I, I'm, I'm not going to like in details of, like what, what these announcements are uh, actually like specifically uh, 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 looks like, but we'll give you in general that, like how it like uh, goes from like the day one, like since the start of, of the coup and then how it developed into like uh, 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 today and also like how it's going to be like after our referendum to the uh, constitution. So uh, the military government uh, appointed a committee to draft uh, con uh, our, uh, the new constitution and we're going to have a referendum on the 7th of August, so it's basically just like next week, right? Like, yeah. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and some of these announcements, I, I, I will explain it later, but like some of these announcements uh, will, will still like will be effective even after we, we, we no longer have the military government. So, uh, how to start? It's just all in time, sorry. But like, I was just like, okay, I will just go like block by, by block briefly. So you can see like how the condition and how is the development, like, like the current state, how, how, how it looks like. So in, in the day one, in the day one, the first block at this one, on the day one, uh, the, uh, the crew NCPO immediately, immediately announced on, at, on, on, on that night that like, uh, that every social media service provider should uh, stop any content that are uh, anti-NCPO, right? So that's the first block. And then following the uh, NCPO announcement number uh, 17, uh, there's another specific, uh, uh, specific announcement asking I, all the ISP to monitor uh, so, social media content, and if there is uh, uh, any content that is uh, specifically uh, like anti the uh, activities of NCPO, uh, ISP should stop that as well. Should censor that basically. And then uh, all this block is about uh, media in general. So all uh, those top blocks, it's uh, it's specifically to uh, specifically to the internet, online content, social media. And uh, around this block, it's it's more about like uh, media in general. So this one said that like the, the NCPO announcement uh, number 14 of 2014 said that uh, the media shouldn't interview uh, academics, civil servants, uh, the and also like those uh, people who used to work for the court or the independent uh, body. Yeah, and also ask the media not to criticize NCPO. Uh, this block, uh, it said like, uh, so, uh, NCPO announcement number 18, they specify like there's a, a seven cat categories that the media shouldn't, uh, uh, put it in the public. And also like related to this one about the media shouldn't give an in interview, they also have another announcement specifically that, okay, so this one say like media shouldn't interview the uh, civil servant and uh, people who used to work for the court, right? This one say like the court itself and the uh, independent bodies shouldn't give the interview to the media. So it's like kind of work together. Uh, these dots show some connections. So uh, this three thing is about like the uh, conditions to be able to uh, use the airwave uh, spectrum to uh, do the uh, television, digital, t this, this is analog television, digital television, radio, right? So there are conditions like if those station doesn't go uh, along with these conditions, uh, the license will be revoked. So basically, uh, and, and all the con conditions that are uh, asked the television and radio is basically like the television and, and radio should follow this announcement strictly.
right? So they shouldn't interview uh, this uh, this group of people. They shouldn't uh, should should avoid from this seven category that like anti the NCPO. So this is like kind of all work together uh, for the media in general. Uh, go to the top again, right? So. Uh, in the first day, right, they they say that like there are some certain kind of uh, uh, content that should be like put online, right? And then later, a month later, uh, by the announcement number uh, 26 of 2014, they say they're setting up like a working group, and then by this one, uh, the Ministry of ICT later uh, has been regrouped to be under the security branch of NCPO. So this is very, very interesting in, in the way that like uh, when the crew has been uh, uh, in, in, in control, they uh, try to reorganize all the ministry, right? So for example, they have like the security branch, they have the economics, uh, society branch, uh, and so on and so on. The interesting part is that like they actually put uh, the ministry of ICT under the security branch. So under the security branch, we have four ministry. Uh, the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of ICT, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right? The first two is quite understandable, right? So it's like uh, internal security and like ex sort of external security, right? But the latter two, it's basically about like information law, we, we can say that. So Ministry of ICT uh, about like information inside the country and Ministry for Foreign Affairs is like, they're actually setting up like uh, a group of people going around the world to like make people un understand that, okay, this coup is like necessary, something like that. So uh, by this announcement, uh, NCPO announcement 22, they say like, okay, Ministry of ICT should be under the security branch of NCPO, right? And by that, later, uh, go on, go on, right? And then uh, this is interesting thing. If you follow the chaos uh, 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 in Thailand, probably, probably you, you, you can you can see uh, in the uh, last year there's a lot of discussion of so-called single gateway, right? About the control of the all the information that to to be passed into the country, and probably uh, doing some, do some monitoring. By all this announcement and the uh, setting up of the uh, so by uh, putting MICT under the security branch of NCPO, the uh, Ministry of ICT also setting up another working group. And that uh, working group to monitor social media, later uh, setting up another working group to test the equipment about the uh, how to, so so the, the, in this announcement uh, of MICT, uh, in this order, MICT order, uh, they say, uh, uh, because there's a lot of encryption on social media, the work of this committee to monitor internet and social media, it's not that really effective because they cannot censor a lot of website. So the, the way it works right now, right, uh, because like uh, Twitter, so Facebook, YouTube, a lot of social media website, they, do, they use HTTPS. Right? So it is difficult for ISP to specifically uh, block a specific uh, website. The only way they can do it, they have to block the whole thing, the the, the whole domain. They cannot uh, uh, block a uh, specific page. So in this MICT order, they say like because of that, there should be some way for uh, to allow the officer, according to that uh, uh, committee, to be able to look into the message and be able to block them. So they uh, test the equipment. And also, uh, this working group uh, duty, another, another duty of this uh, uh, working group is like, after the case that they should also cooperate with the international gateway in Thailand to see if the, this equipment is working well with the configuration of the international limit gateway. So you can see like kind of the development from the day one, yep, in, into all these like uh, uh, more and more. So this one is like more in general, and then. Uh, like 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 a principle. What kind of content that shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be allowed uh, uh, online and like auto media. And then from those principle like about the content right that that prohibited. They are going on like okay, let's setting up some working group. And after the working group, they say okay, we have uh, identified some of the problem that uh, doesn't allow us 
to block some of this content. So let's introduce some technical measure, technological measure here. I will stop here and say that like all these announcements, like according to our uh, draft constitution, uh, it and in in the last section of our draft constitution, constitution uh, in the article uh, two seven nine, it said that all the NCPO announcement and order should be in effect even after uh, the uh, the military government uh, has been gone. Like even so, basically, even we have a, 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 a election and have a new government, all these order will be still in place. And this is the last clause. They say like, okay, but just like all the laws, uh, it can be amended, but it can be only be amended uh, if the senate agree. And in the first five years all the senators will come uh, will be appointed by NCPO. So you can see that like it's going to be very difficult to amend this law in the first five years of, of, even after like like we we we, we uh, the, the constitution like has been passed, ha has been approved. Because all the people in the senior will be appointed by the NCPO anyway in the first five years. So I'll finish this. Yep, thanks. There, there, above, right there. Yes. Good. Um, there are many threats to free expression in Korea. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk about uh, criminal ones, or ones based on uh, criminal law. Um, Now, many of the, these uh, uh, criminalized threats to free speech uh, are packaged or justified as a protection for right personality. And people should not be misled because right personality is, uh, is uh, uh, praised as uh, something good, something important for human rights. But in reality, uh, it can be abused to the extent that I'm going to describe. So uh, Article, 3, uh, uh, Article 311, uh, we have insert law. Article 307, paragraph 1, truth defamation. Uh, 307, 2, falsity defamation. And Personal Data Protection Act and also portrait right cases, uh, judge-made law, also uh, pose threat to free expression. On the surface, it seems like uh, there is a strong protection of uh, one's right to personality, but that affects other people's freedom of talking about that person. Insert law. So any public epithet against another is indictable to one year in prison. And every year, we have like 9,000 uh, indictments for insult which lead to uh, about 50 incarcerations every year. Um, about 10% is for insulting uh, police officers. Um, it mostly results in fines. And the requirement is that the supposed victim of insult uh, has to uh, file a criminal complaint for the case to move forward. Now, you can compare that to uh, German or uh, Japanese situation, uh, Germany also has a, a strong, uh, vigorous prosecution for insert, but it's done through private prosecution, which does not involve police or prosecutors. So the chilling effect there is much less. Um, Japan also has a insult 
uh, law, but it's it's a it's a petty crime. Um, the highest uh, uh, sentence will be like uh, 10 days in jail, compare that to one year uh, in Korea. Now, insert law. Uh, you may think that, oh, okay, well, the state trying to protect people from feeling insulted uh, may be a good thing, but think about it. When do you get insert? When do you get insulted? When was the, you know, when did you get insulted most? So insulted that you know you lost appetite and stopped sleeping. Uh, for me, uh, that's when I was dumped by my first girlfriend when I was 15. Uh, or when I got uh, C plus coming out of an exam that I thought was getting an A. Uh, all feelings of insult uh, come from the discrepancy between how you want to be treated and how the external world treats you. Uh, so this project of trying to protect people from feeling insulted uh, really cuts against uh, uh, how the society operates. Because uh, all true evaluations, if, if you want to be evaluated, you have to risk receiving lesser evaluation than you expected. Um, now, hate speech regulation is something different. Uh, it's designed to, it's not designed to protect people from feeling insulted, but it's designed to protect people from discrimination, violence, then may be caused by uh, hateful words. Truth defamation. Any non-first statement lowering another's reputation is indictable for three years. Um, and there's an exemption for statements made solely for public interest. Uh, but this so uh, many people justify uh, this criminal provision uh, by pointing to this exemption for uh, public uh, uh, exemption for statements are made solely for public uh, public interest. But the chilling effect is great because uh, it's a true statement. You have to say it. You want to say it, but without being sure that it will be considered made solely for public interest, you cannot say it. You, you, you uh, uh, withdraw yourself from public discourse. And in Korea, uh, the public interest has been uh, interpreted as narrow. Uh, for instance, a worker uh, criticizing the employer for not paying his wages was considered not making statement for, solely for public interest because Right, because he because he was considered he was deemed to be saying the, that that uh, making the statement to get his wages paid, so it was not solely for public public interest, right? And then other cases also uh, are equally uh, nonsensical. Uh, well, some people will say, uh, well, even so, if you are using. Uh, public sphere, if you are entering public sphere with uh, your ideas, uh, don't you have to have some public interest to enter that sphere? But think about it. Why should we be restricted in speaking truth even if they are uncomfortable to others? As long as you, know, you are not like forcing other people, uh, you are not like doing some sort of like forced coming out of uh, uh, you know, sexual minorities or uh, revealing uh, some confidential uh, information uh, of uh, others. Um, and if you impose that public interest obligation on people trying to say something that are truthful, that are not confidential, uh, then you are losing uh, a lot of important debate and you are uh, basically making whistleblowing impossible uh, in that uh, society. Um, 
And public interest can be defined only in a collectivistic manner, which means uh, a collective, a, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of majoritarian or averageitarian concept. Um, but freedom of speech is there for individuals, right? Individuals uh, far on one end of the spectrum should be able to say things as long as they are not harming others. As long as it is lawful, people should be able to say things. And uh, truth defamation is, uh, uh, is, is a narrowing uh, that pluralistic uh, spectrum that uh, the society should enjoy. Falsely defamation. Uh, so, you know, this one, many countries has falsely defamation, but the problem with Korea is that every year there's like 2,000 indictments which lead to like 50 incarcerations. And uh, I did the statistics for like 20, uh, 20 month period back in 2005. Uh, in that period, the 2,000, uh, 50 incarcerations accounted for 28% of all incarcerations around the world, uh, which makes Korea uh, the capital of uh, uh, criminal incarceration for uh, defamation. And then many of those uh, uh, falsely defamations are uh, seditious uh, libel case, which means uh, defamation or libel cases designed to put down sedition, which means uh, 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 defamation prosecution is designed to protect uh, the state and state officials' uh, uh, defamations. Now, so uh, UN knows about this. So. The uh, UN Human Rights Committee uh, has issued uh, uh, General Comment 34 because uh, Korea and many other countries uh, have truth defamation and insult law and also vigorous prosecution for falsely defamation which uh, uh, threaten free speech. So they issued this, uh, uh, not General Commitment, sorry, it's General Comment, General Comment 34. It, say, it says many things, uh, but three important, three relevant things uh, uh, is that there should not be criminal punishment for statements not subject to verification. What are statements subject to verification? What are statements subject to verification? Uh, not subject to verification. What are statements of feelings, statements of opinions? So that statement bans insult law. And truth must be sufficient defense. It, uh, it sh the, the defense should not require things like public interest. And also try to stay away, uh, I'm sorry, uh, try to stay away from criminal prosecution for defamation. Uh, and also uh, UN Human Rights Committee uh, in concluding observation on South Korea in 2015 also uh, recommended to abolish truth defamation and UN Special Repertoire on Free Speech, LARU also uh, noted that many prosecutions, many defamation prosecutions uh, are for protecting uh, state officials and also recommended to uh, abolish truth defamation. So I'll stop here. Uh, again, this is only one of the threats, uh, criminalized threats, but criminal law is really important because it has the most, uh, it, it has the most oppressive uh, chilling effect. And uh, other threats, uh, my colleague Ji Won uh, will cover. Thank you. Um, hi, um, good morning. I am uh, Jam Mahob. I'm a lawyer by profession and um, I represent actually Foundation for Media Alternatives, which is a um, civil society organization based in the Philippines, working towards the promotion of communication rights, and currently, uh, in particular, internet rights. Um, so the, the Philippines actually uh, is supposedly the oldest uh, democracy in Asia, and one would think that, uh, as such, uh, freedom of expression would be well entrenched or well protected in our particular country. But then, as probably many of you uh, are aware, 
we did have that uh, dark period in the 1970s wherein uh, martial law was declared and freedom of expression was very much uh, suppressed or curtailed. Um, and then um, a few years back, uh, we had uh, supposed uh, what's called as the Maguindanao Massacre wherein around uh, 58 uh, individuals, most of them journalists, uh, were killed in an election-related uh, uh, killing killings for that matter and just earlier this year supposedly the Philippines is the second most dangerous country for journalists in the past 25 years uh, so so much for uh, democracy and freedom of expression right um, and then right now we have our new president uh, which uh, at some point actually made very controversial a controversial statement wherein uh, one a very vocal uh, critic uh, of his, a journalist, as it happens, uh, was killed extrajudicially, and uh, there was he made this particular remark wherein uh, he alluded to the fact that uh, some journalists actually deserve to die if they're corrupt, for that matter. And then later on, uh, his people, and I think he himself, said uh, or clarified that that statement was taken out of context. Uh, but then uh, you look at the entirety of his statements these past few months and uh, it's difficult really uh, how much of that clarification or justification you, you, one would be willing to uh, believe uh, given the many other outrageous and controversial statements he has made while as, uh, as a mayor down in, uh, in Mindanao uh, and as a presidential candidate and now as a sitting president of the Philippines. Um, so this is the context that we have right now in the Philippines and uh, one could, uh, when one can already somewhat uh, gauge uh, what, uh, what is in store, I suppose, for freedom of expression in the Philippines. Um, as of now, uh, we can probably identify a number of, of uh, specific laws that has uh, a large impact, a negative impact uh, for that matter. Uh, insofar as freedom of expression is concerned, we have uh, the, our Cybercrime Prevention Act uh, uh, passed into law a couple of years ago, which was, just, which was challenged in the Supreme Court. A couple of its provisions have since been declared unconstitutional, but one of the more contentious ones, the one on uh, cyber libel, was actually upheld by our Supreme Court. Uh, we have our Anti-Child Pornography Act, which uh, while its objective is laudable, it actually has also uh, some controversial provisions, including the imposition, the imposition of mandatory installation of filtering um, software or programs imposed on uh, telcos or ISPs. Um, we have a specific provision, ironically enough, in our Data Privacy Act, wherein uh, it is actually made a, a punishable offense to uh, maliciously disclose, supposedly, uh, personal information, which one, when one comes to think of it, actually um, um, could actually translate to another libel-like type of uh, offense. And then um, we have our old anti-wiretapping law, uh, which is probably our oldest and still most cited uh, surveillance or anti-surveillance uh, legislation, and the Human Security Act, which partially amends our anti-wiretapping law in the sense that uh, terrorism or those suspected of, of committing or engaging in terrorism may now be subjected to uh, surveillance. Uh, as far as the state agencies or state uh, organizations or offices engaged in uh, what one would consider as, as either censorship or filtering or surveillance, among those uh, one could readily point out would be our Department of Justice and uh, under which there is the Office of the Cybercrime uh, and uh, as an attached agency, our National Bureau of Investigation, uh, the a counterpart, I suppose, of the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation. We have, of course, our uh, Philippine, Philippine National Police and Armed Forces of the Philippines and a slew of other um, 
little known but very, quite active in fact uh, intelligence agencies uh, which very few uh, among the in the public are aware of what they're doing and what legal authorities they are operating under like the national intelligence coordinating agency um, so what are subject to all these uh, mesh censorship measures filtering measures um, surveillance uh, mechanisms uh, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, cyber libel or those offenses that may co be considered libelous in the context of, of uh, ICT, in the internet, uh, and other cyber crimes are supposedly now subject to uh, surveillance. Um, and given that they actually make these uh, specific offenses punishable, like uh, libelous statements supposedly online, then uh, for many, since we have, uh, it's a very vague uh, provision, it has, and our libel uh, laws actually has been contested for quite some time now, uh, amounts to actually censorship. Uh, again, uh, we have child pornography, uh, which is being used by our government as, uh, as justification for imposing that filtering uh, software or the installation of that particular software or program, malicious disclosure of information. And then the... Uh, the offenses you have here are actually uh, the ones, the exceptions in our anti wiretapping law or surveillance law. Uh, when uh, of, of law enforcement authorities are investigating uh, individuals uh, for any of these offenses, uh, one could actually, they would actually be exempt from the anti wiretapping law or surveillance law. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, the Human Security Act. It expanded the coverage of that exemption by including now uh, terrorism. So given that, uh, with those government agencies and those laws, what instances of censorship or surveillance do we now see, currently see in the Philippines? Ironically enough, uh, it's not based on any of those particular laws. What we have right now, just this past couple of years, are actually forms uh, or acts or uh, actions that somewhat amount to censorship, but they're not being committed by, by the government, but actually by a very private uh, corporation or company for that matter. Uh, in this case, you have Facebook. And uh, unfortunately for Facebook, I, I suppose their mechanism for ensuring what would actually constitute as something worthy of censoring or, or take, uh, being taken down uh, is not that effective uh, in the sense that many that one would consider as valid uh, expressions of one, one's free speech or uh, freedom of expression have actually been subjected to such uh, takedown actions uh, by uh, Facebook. So as you can see, uh, in these examples, uh, statements or posts by journalists have actually been removed uh, by Facebook. Uh, one in particular uh, became quite newsworthy in the Philippines was one journalist who simply made uh, or, or aired his opinion as to his uh, opposition uh, to the current president, our current president, planning to allow the burial of our former dictator in this uh, um, in this uh, cemetery that's usually that's reserved actually for heroes uh, or soldiers for that matter and for the longest time people or the public have been opposing uh, that uh, precisely because of his role in the imposition of martial, martial law and the many human rights violations committed during that time uh, so this journalist posted uh, or um, made a post or uh, aired his opinion on Facebook and then Facebook uh, took it down. Uh, he repeated or he made another, a similar post and then Facebook uh, took it down again. And then uh, suspended him actually for uh, 24 hours and then later on uh, sent a very short uh, apology saying that uh, one of its one member of its staff actually made a mistake of, of committing all those takedown actions, um, and so this particular case uh, highlights one of the more common uh, um, occurrences right now in the Philippines, insofar as 
uh, censorship is concerned. Uh, as regards surveillance, uh, we have a history of uh, our uh, military a uh, agents uh, engaged in surveillance against our very own presidents, uh, at minus the R, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, and then the late uh, former President Corazon Aquino, as you will see. Um, and then a slew of other uh, cases wherein you have whistleblowers uh, having their conversation, uh, phone conversations, uh, wiretapped by who uh, it's not actually very clear. It just they just fall into the hands of of, uh, of the media or in some cases politicians. There. So with that uh, all happening right now, what are the emerging th threats? I mentioned this once already in the previous panel. So we have the proposed national ID system, uh, which is being, not surprisingly, being supported by our uh, current president. We have uh, another uh, proposed measure, which is the mandatory SIM card registration, uh, which other than um, uh, threatening uh, the one's right to anonymity, uh, actually uh, translates, although one could say not directly, but uh, to a threat as well to freedom of expression because as many of us know, anonymity actually enables freedom of expression in many instances. And then finally, uh, even more uh, exceptions or exemptions to our anti war tapping law. So I think I'll end there uh, and I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions later on regarding uh, our situation in the Philippines. Thank you. Yeah, um, moment. All right, testing, testing one, two, three. Okay, let's start. Uh, okay, so let's get this out of the way. We have 99 problem, but cybercrime law, unlike other country, cybercrime law does not contribute to censorship and digital rights problem. So yes, but we do have other law. Uh, so I will tell this later. Fun fact, two of three laws that involve in, uh, that violate digital rights is, uh, does not involve blocking the internet, but you do have to go to jail. Sorry. So first one is Sedition Act. Don't bother with the text. It essentially drip down to this. If you insult the uh, ruler, you go to jail. If you insult the government, you go to jail. If you incite violence, you go to jail, and etc. So, so people that are actually being charged by the Sedition Act is politician, activist, lawyer, and more importantly, cartoonist. So arguably, the dude is actually a political crit critic that draw comics. So yeah. Okay, so the second one that involves in digital rights uh, is actually the Multimedia and Communication Act. Very cool law, actually, uh, because this actually uh, allowed the creation of the Malaysian Communication Multimedia Commission, which is actually essentially the FCC of Malaysia. Uh, so it actually do more than just censorship. It actually uh, manage the spectrum, give license to ISP, manage the radio, television, etc. It So the not so cool thing about this Actually, there's another thing that they also do consumer right and whatnot. What's not very cool, they actually have a very tight control of license. They have a way uh, they can actually uh, censor the internet. They have the right to do so if it's porn and whatnot. Uh, there's a few cause of concern for this law. One, uh, so if you insult person in real life, you only you need to find for 100 ringgit, uh, 33 US dollar roughly. Uh, if you're on site online, it's 50 k ringgit, a lot more than that. So meaning, it's better for you to insult a person in front of their face than on the internet. So trolling is bad. Okay, uh, I forget to add a few things down here. Uh, we actually had a few new amendments uh, for the for the same law. Uh, we only have rumors; we don't have proof. Some of the concern is we, there is suggestion that the one uh, real name registration for bloggers. Of website registration, and the second one is actually logging, uh, logging on ISP. Uh, yeah, I think that's the two main one that I forgot to add in here. So another uh, interesting thing about the Communication Multimedia Act is we have a very wide exemption of what intermediary is. So in this case, intermediary is really just ISP. So website provider don't count. 
data center don't count cash uh, cash CDN don't count etc so you got a very wide list so essentially the only person that is liable is essentially your ISP and your telco and radio television etc so okay so here this dude is actually this is actually a big case this person is actually got charged uh, on the communication multimedia act for the abuse of abuse of network usage uh, it, but what this guy really does is comment on a forum. Commenting on a forum, let him go to jail. He had three charge of. Okay, uh, I don't remember the count. There's a full charge. It's essentially a mix of sedition, uh, charge under sedition act, and the uh, network abuse on the communication act, communication multimedia act. Next, and oh, this is my favorite: the publication and uh, printing press and publication act. Uh, so this law actually uh, a merging of two law, uh, printing act and publication act in 1984. So it, what this does is it actually uh, moni monitor the printing press, newspaper, book, printer, etc. Uh, oops, wrong button. Fun fact, publication include, how do you use the laser? Documents and stuff, anything with inform, shape, and any manner that capable of suggesting words and ideas. So this term is actually very right. They're literally talking about any form of media, from television, radio, internet, etc. And fun fact number two, we really believe that it will, uh, the law might cover smoke signals, flags, and homing pigeons. But then, don't take my word for it, I'm just a system administrator. So, okay, so the next one is actually surveillance law. Uh, okay, so we do have some surveillance law. Uh, the first one is the Prevention of Crime Act. This is an ancient law, thanks to the British, sorry. Uh, so this is actually a law that is used uh, for preventing the secret society, criminals and whatnot. So it allows two things. Uh, if a person being charged, they have to attach a monitoring device and they're going to block them from using the internet, apparently. So meaning that we monitored and they got sent back to the Stone Age. So the second law is actually the Security Offenses Special Measures Act. So this law actually used for political movement, etc. Uh, so this one, uh, they got expansion, extension of law regulator for terrorists, but uh, terrorism can be charged on here. So what this does is allow the authority to do wiretapping, and at, uh, if you are a terrorist, non-terrorist, the God charge, you'll be attached with a bracelet uh, uh, to trace you. So this is uh, the code is a SOSMA. Uh, oh, but one more thing, uh, this is actually known to be used against bloggers, website owner, and whatnot. So this is actually a pretty bad law. And finally, we got the new Prevention of Terrorist Act. It's actually a uh, somewhat uh, extension of SOSMA, the law just now. Uh, except a non terrorist, after reform, will be released uh, attached with a GPS bracelet. Uh, on the leg ankle. So, but on the other hand, it's a good, the good thing about being terrorist after you release, it won't be sent back to the Stone Age. So I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so we have two methods for censorship. Uh, uh, from this on, this is actually a bit technical. Uh, the main one is actually DNS blocking. Uh, so what happened is, uh, there is actually a list of domain that is being blocked on the ISP run DNS server run by the ISP. So, uh, interesting thing is, uh, we've been trying to ask for the list. So the commission asked us to check the ISP, and the ISP as I check back to. So it point that we never get it. And fortunately, you can easily bypass it using DNS, uh, open DNS servers, like Google DNS and whatnot. Unless your phone, if you're on phone, you're screwed, sorry. Uh, also, here's the cool thing we really want to do. I will try to get more people to use DNS sec. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, DNS sec actually had two things that we can use. Uh, one, it returned a new query that returned a set of key that registered to a domain name. And also, I think they encrypt the co uh, communication. I need to double check on that. So this make detection of interference on DNS level easy to find out. So, but unfortunately, the adoption is a bit low. Uh, we hope to get more people to adopt this tool. Okay, the other, uh, the next, I, will call, I won't call it attack, I call it manipulation. It's actually done on ISP level. 
This is what we call the DPI attack, the packet inspection attack. So it only happens once, and they're actually uh, manipulating, I think it's either sequence number and enrichment number. So what they do is they inflate the last number of one packet so that the, uh, the packet takes too long to reach the destination, therefore the packet get dropped. So uh, it's one of those attack that, actually it's a very cool attack, by the way. I know I shouldn't say this, but this is actually very cool. But it's also very, but it's also very scary at the same time. So, but fortunately, because uh, this can easily be solved by using HTTPS, just encrypt a packet using SSL, what not. So, uh, HTTPS, that's awesome. And let's encrypt team. Thanks for giving us the free DNS. You just stopped a very scary attack in Malaysia. And finally, this is actually what happening with our project. Oh, I got time. Uh, one, this is a DJMO project. Uh, so the DJMO project is actually our uh, clearinghouse of digital violation information. So we're actually collecting information like internet blocking, uh, maybe asset, uh, monitoring, possible monitoring time or not. We also do tasks similar to CERT uh, in a way that we're actually giving as much or not because uh, CERT do not handle these kind of issues. Uh, we have the technical capability to handle that. So that's another one. And second here, this is actually the goodness that just does a photo. Okay, so this is actually one of our network sensor. I uh, will call this the sensor sensor because it just sounds funny. So uh, this tool is actually a small Linux computer that actually automatically run network testing scripts to test uh, for censorship of certain domain name. Uh, so what, uh, and we actually gather the data to be analyzed. Uh, there's a reason why we use this, because no one in their right mind going to spend 24 hours to click on the website every single minute. So it's just insane. So we just uh, automate it using a small Linux computer to plug on the router to keep testing the network. And finally, we actually involved in the global campaign. Uh, Keep It On campaign is actually a project by Access uh, against internet shutdown. So here's the thing about internet shutdown. It does not mean you can shut down the internet. You can't. It does not mean blocking internet from the country. That maybe happened. I think that's crazy, but that really happened. But in this case, uh, the, uh, the definition also includes uh, taking down of a service, website, ports, etc. So the, uh, it's one of the campaigns we work on. Another tool that we adopt is actually the UMI-script, the Open Observatory for Never Interrup Interference. So what they do is they provide a set of software scripts to measure internet uh, censorship part. So they do HTTP tests, DNS tests, packet tests, etc. And this is actually the same script that we use on our network sensor. And finally, we actually encourage everybody in our country to use two of these tools. Uh, this actually make it easy to set up a VPN on the network. So if a certain set do get blocked, um, they just bypass it on this. And two things I want to show to you guys. One, which is scarier, got your internet blocked or going to jail? Because that is precisely what happening to our country right now. And finally, uh, currently we have to hack around a lot of the situation, building tools and whatnot. How far can you hack your way around this? And with this, thank you for listening. So sorry for my rambling. And yeah, I had to say that I did not make this up. You can look it up on the internet. Thank you. Hey, hi, I'm Jun Sun, the project manager of Korea Internet Transparency Reporting. In this session, I'm going to talk about the problem of Korean administrative online censorship, censorship system. The system, while not requiring criminal penalty, but will pose a significant risk to freedom of online expression because it can easily be abused to controlling public opinion by directly deleting posts, thereby critically infringing upon freedom of online expression. South Korea has the administrative body called KCSC, Korea Communication Standard Commission, and it can make decision to take down online information. The decision is innocently called a correction request. However, the decision 
uh, has the factor binding effect resulting in the compliance rates of almost 100%. And KCSC's nine members are all appointed by the president, and six are nominated by the ruling party, and three by the opposition party. Um, KCSC has made about 150,000 takedown decisions last year. The standard is to make my takedown decisions are not limited to illegal things because the statutory provision allows the KCSC to regulate the online information when it's necessary for nurturing sound communication ethics. Thanks to this vague standard, KCSC can take down not only illegal contents but also allegedly harmful but lawful content. More specific and problematic standards for harmful contents are as follows using excessive swearing or vulgar language and violent, clear and disgusting content, incitement of social unrest, etc. The most serious problem of administrative censorship is that it has a high risk of abuse by the incumbent government in attempt to suppress the opposition voice against the government. Let me show you some examples. The Twitter account, which sounds like an epithet, against that then President Lee was blocked for the reason of using excessive swearing. And a post that blames the government's incompetence of rescue operation in national tragedy sales very sinking accident was deleted because that post contained some swearing to the president and high ranking officials. The standard so the, the, the standard was certainly causing most concern is incitement social unrest. KSSC, after first applying this clause on March last year, has been deleting numerous content that pose question on the facts announced by the government. The post that claim, claimed that NIS was involved in import and maintenance of a sunk sail ferry was responsible for the cause and aftermath of that incident was deleted. And the post claiming that South Korean government has fabricated incidents of North Korean aggression was deleted. And a post claiming that the nurse was staged by the MIS or Bubble House to turn the media attention away from controversies at the time surrounding the government was deleted for the reason of incitement of social unrest. An administrative agency censoring people's expressions based on an abstract and authoritarian standard is seen by many as an abuse of power to compel totalitarian mindset or criticism of the state and controlling public opinion. As such, there exists a rising concern that is that it's unconstitutional. There are many problematic cases where cases that block the websites which just deliver the North Korean statements or reporting from the Korean North Korean news service. Uh, for the for the reason of it being a site that praises, incites, and glorifies the North Korean in violation of the controversial Article 7 of the National Security Act. Um, recently, on March this year, KCSC decided to block access to a certain website called North Korea Tech for the reason of uh, in violation of this article. The North Korea Tech is a, a kind of media blog that is run by British journalists covering the North Korean ICT issues for academic and reporting purposes. So it's quite renowned worldwide for its unique expertise on the North Korea ICT news, cited by various media, including Wall Street Journal, Reader, BBC, and even the South, South Korea Press. The case has seen decided to block this the website just because some of information in the blog quotes or posts linked to the reports and data from the North Korean media. 
And Korean Civil Society and Transparency Reporting Team is working on um, medical challenges against these censorship cases and promoting what's related effort to revision in order to reduce the possibility of abusing censorship system. Permanently, several lawsuits against KCSC takedown decision have been conducted, but not with great success. However, as recent victory highlights, the in inappropriateness of KCSC's blocking whole website, KCSC decided to block access to the globally popular file sharing website called foreshare.com that provides file sharing and searching and streaming services, citing its alleged violation of copyright law and in distribution of some illegal copies of Korean content. On January this year, the court ruled that decision is unlawful. They found that determination of whether the whole website constitutes an illegal information should be conducted under a strict and narrow standard, such as whether the purpose of operating the website is to aid illegal activities itself. So it's a is this proportionate to block entire website just because some illegal contents were distributed therein? While this logic is a very natural conclusion, but Kurt's clear findings for this logic will hopefully put a break to the case that says current illegal website blocking practice. This this case is ongoing on appellate court as KCSC appealed. And the, and the lawsuit against the decision of blocking North Korea attack mentioned just before is un, also underway. There exist numerous information on the internet citing North Korea news report as the source. And we hope that the current practice and current practice news, current practice and risk of banning such information as a violation of Article 7 of the National Security Act uh, will also cease uh, with new court findings, we hope. And we have recently covered, discovered that not only KCFC, but also the National Election Commission's power of deleting posts in violation of the Public Official Election Act is problematic in many aspects. The Korean Election Act prohibits dissemination of false facts about candidates, including a person who intended to become a candidate and his or her family. And the dissemination of even true facts are also prohibited as long as it deemed to be for slander purposes. As such, the scope of information that may that may be found to be in violation of this act is very wide and even legitimate criticism and suspicion on the politician may also subject to the deletion. According to the answer to recent FOIA request, it was discovered that over 17,000 posts were deleted by the NEC's order only in relation to April National Assembly election in Korea. We will also work on revision of these acts. And to, f and to find out more uh, about the status of or issues of Korean online censorship, please visit our Korean Internet Transparency Report website. And because of the light and liberal nature of online expression, authority seems to underweight its value and feel that it can easily take down such online expression based on broad and arbitrary standard. And policies are also made and implemented under this belief, I think. And many authoritarian nations may have urged to control the online information and try to systemize the online censorship system. So the stakeholders should continue to the, discussion on the online censorship issue in order to prevent the, the system from being abused to infringe our online freedom of expression and right to know. Thank you. Oh, 
Hi. Uh, thank you to our panelists for their presentations. And I'd like to open it to the floor if anyone has any questions or even to panelists to, to ask each other questions. Go ahead. Good morning. I'm Oliver Reyes. I'm from the Philippines and I'm presenting the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. Um, my question is, I'm just curious whether in your respective jurisdictions um, the, there's this concept called the right to reply wherein if somebody makes a, uh, a commentary uh, political commentary in whatever medium, whether it be in the newspaper or online, uh, the person who is commented to has a right to equal space to reply to the commentary or allegations. So to cite one, one example, if some, you write a blog post about a political figure, that political figure has the right to insist on replying on the same space, meaning that that you're, you have, as a blogger, the compulsion to post that figure's response to your post. Um, this was a concept in the U.S. which was discarded only in the 1980s for broadcast media. I'm just wondering whether this concept has all, is also present in your respective jurisdictions and what you think about the concept. I can talk about um, uh, fairness uh, doctrine and uh, broadcasting regulation in Korea. Um, we are uh, proposing to abolish it because uh, many broadcasting stations start out as uh, state entities, even if they are, even if they are somehow uh, changed a little bit and labeled as public broadcasting as opposed to government broadcasting. Uh, the government continues to exercise influence on appointment and programming of the uh, 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 of the uh, so-called uh, uh, public uh, broadcasting. Um, and uh, on top of that, uh, so, uh, so in, in that situation, uh, fairness review uh, should be used uh, should be used to um, uh, neutralize um, what may what has the danger of be becoming government propaganda. Uh, but that has not happened because who will conduct fairness doctrine? Who will appoint the officials conducting fairness review? Um, the appointees will serve the interest of the power that has appointed them. Um, so uh, in Korea, uh, for about past uh, three years, um, there were like uh, uh, between 30, uh, uh, 30 to 40 uh, fairness reviews of uh, broadcasting content. Uh, all of them, uh, all, the, uh, all the disciplines made on uh, fairness uh, review were made against uh, content that were critical of the government. Uh, and the broadcasting stations already under the influence of the government are broadcasting uh, pro-government content uh, you know, without scruples. Uh, the uh, fairness review committee uh, is a uh, punishing the content that's critical of the government, so you can see the end result. So I'd be very careful in instituting uh, a fairness uh, uh, review on broadcasting content. Hello, this is Babura Marial from Nepal. By profession, I'm a lawyer, and I started my career as journalist. And uh, I was also one of founding uh, team member of Online Journalist Association of Nepal. Uh, there's a big debate of criminalization of freedom of expression online. 
uh, do you think uh, there should not be any criminal liability of uh, any publication online? Can I? Because uh, any news matters or any content published online could be very uh, uh, offensive to someone or, or uh, made a damage uh, fame or uh, privacy of uh, an individual. Even in that case, uh, we should not apply criminal law. Thank you. Um, uh, did I understand the question correctly? Uh, your question is, uh, in our, in my opinion, at least, uh, do I believe uh, that? Online should online publication deemed uh, very offensive or uh, something like that to a particular person, I suppose, be held criminal. May it be criminally uh, liable, or the person who posted it may it be held criminally liable? Yes, yes. Sometimes it's very uh, critical, very uh, offensive. Uh, any content could be very offensive uh, online, and in that case. Uh, uh, many countries are using uh, criminal defamation laws uh, to to uh, cause such kind of situation. So, uh, do you advocate uh, abolishing criminal defamation online, or, or uh, there is some need of some level of need of uh, criminal defamation? Um, well, I can only speak for myself, and I suppose our, our organization, since uh, I guess it would depend on, on who you ask uh, oh, in the Philippines for, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Yes. For his, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually, there is a, this global trend actually towards the the opposite, I suppose. Uh, you could say that towards the criminalization of libel, whether it is online or, or, or offline. So to that extent, uh, I would uh, think that the the trend right now is in favor of decriminalizing uh, that particular, uh, this particular uh, act. Um, given that, I am fully aware, of course, that uh, cultural differences usually uh, uh, factor in which makes things complicated. I'm not saying that it should be used as a uh, justification right there and then and as a constant, constant justification uh, in any situation. But I, in my opinion, I think uh, I, I still uh, move towards decriminalization. Uh, in the Philippines, for instance, uh, there has been a, a human, uh, uh, UN rather, uh, uh, written, I, I suppose, comment regarding a particular case wherein uh, the, the Philippines was actually instructed or advised uh, to, to work towards decriminalizing or, or abolishing its, its, its libel laws. And ironically enough, uh, so this is why I'm saying that it depends who you ask for in the Philippines. Ironically enough, after that uh, UN uh, opinion, so to speak, the, it was actually the time that the Philippines enacted the cyber libel uh, law. So instead of abiding or, or complying or acknowledging that opinion by the United Nations, the, the Philippines went, the, uh, the Philippine government went the opposite direction. And even because cyber libel compared to regular or offline libel in the Philippines actually uh, punished uh, or given a heavier penalty as opposed to uh, offline libel. So in, my, in our case, in our organization, we are moving towards the opposite direction. But as of now, our government appears to be moving towards the opposite direction. Uh, general, uh, here's what I think about uh, offensive, offensive publication online. No, in fact, offline online to me is the same. Put it this way: if somebody puts something offensive, you can counter, uh, write a counter argument and whatnot. Uh, don't block it. Don't criminalize it. So free speech, free speech is doesn't go only one way; it goes both way. So somebody can say something bad, you. If you think it's offensive, you have the right to uh, talk back to the other person. So, um, I'm actually like uh, come back to the, the, the question that uh, a guy from uh, ABA asked, actually asking about the uh, right to reply, right? Uh, in case of Thailand, uh, to my knowledge, I just like search this. Uh, 
we, I mean, our broadcasting uh, regulator doesn't actually have the power to, I mean, oh, so uh, say this first, that kind of concept, it's around uh, in the uh, journalist uh, uh, circles, right? But it's not like actually they put in the law. In the law, it's only say about like fairness, right? And uh, so the only thing that uh, actually our broadcasting regulator can do, like according to the law, is that like they, they can, intervene and revoke license only if the uh, media uh, add some uh, content that uh, could be something like about pornography, some like incitement to the monarchy or the national security. So it's only like in these three categories that uh, the broadcasting regulator can actually revoke the license. Uh, anyway, anyway uh, the uh, regulator can prop, uh, can uh, send the case, ask, ask the uh, media uh, ethic board, which is like uh, another body, not, really, not, not, not under the control of the regulator to uh, review the case and ask the media to actually like sort of like so regulate themselves uh, or if, if, if they face anything, if, if they got like any like uh, uh, a petition on this. So thanks. There's, there's nothing actually specify, uh, specific, specifically about the right to reply. Next. I, um, I have a, want to share a feeling I have about these sessions. I have been to plenty of sessions of um, similar to the setting and as an audience and non-citizens of either Thailand, Philippines, South Korea, uh, or uh, um, uh, the other countries, uh, it's very difficult for me to judge what kind of stories you are telling me. And um, so the informational value um, to put your stories in some kind of a context is really difficult. Um, so I wonder, um, I think it would be much more interesting for me if I had somebody from the Thai uh, government agency sitting here uh, talking to you, and then we have like a real discussion and uh, some fighting, you know, and then of course maybe each of you tell lies, but at least I have a kind of a, um, a better comparison of where you are coming from, what is your reasoning, how are you arguing. You know, now I hear academics and I hear people from the kind of civil society organizations, um, but I don't hear what the government is saying. How are they arguing? How are they defending their their measures on how they control the internet or control a freedom of expression? So, so just like a question: How could we make these kind of uh, sessions um, more balanced? Although it's maybe not realistic, but what do you? How could we make it more refreshing to hear also the bad guys from the government? We always invite governments. I know, I know. Yes, but <laughs> they're not coming. Yeah, uh, I would also make the same uh, observation. And in the case of the Philippines, civil society has been trying uh, to get uh, the Philippine government to engage more at the international uh, level and international fora such as this one. Uh, but unfortunately, so far, uh, they have failed to heed our, our call. and. I, I guess for in the past few years they 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 have usually uh, uh, alluded to the fact that we have no dedicated ministry or department on ICTs. But now, uh, just I think two months ago, we do have one. Uh, we do have a, a DICT right now, and our National Privacy Commission also was just established this March. So we're hoping uh, that in future uh, events such as this one. Uh, we will be having uh, more uh, spaces, dialogues with our, our governments, not just uh, this one, of course, and more, more importantly, in our respective jurisdiction, we'll be able to engage with them more. But uh, we, we fully agree with your observation that it would be better if, uh, since I think a multi-stakeholder approach is usually what's being advocated in, 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 in situations like this, that it truly be a multi-stakeholder and in particular that it includes uh, the states or government representatives.
Thank you. I think that was a really um, good discussion because you, you've pretty much mapped out all the different challenges, right? Just a couple of observations. Uh, Southeast Asia has a, a different set of challenges and South Asia has, in some cases, a much more severe sort of uh, challenges. So I would think it would have been kind of good to to also have someone from South Asia, whether it's India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, or Sri Lanka, um, also weighing in on the challenges we are facing. So if you don't mind, I just, I just want to take a minute to flag what's happening in South Asia. A lot of the challenges are very similar, but a lot of challenges are much worse. Um, I think when we're looking at freedom of expression, the emerging challenges, we cannot be blindsided by what's happening to the bloggers in Bangladesh. Um, the offline consequences for blogging are serious, not only for them, for their families, and more particularly for their female uh, partners and family members. Uh, they've been killed. Literally, uh, by now, 24 bloggers have been killed in Bangladesh, including activists and HRDs. So that's one, for writing online. The second major challenge is um, the emerging ICT laws. Um, like the person from the Philippines pointed out, it, and, and the person from Malaysia pointed out, we have specific laws and ICTs coming up, but then offline laws are also being used. And what's happening is that when they're using the offline laws, they're making it even more severe for online expression. And the issue I'm trying to point out here is that there's really a pressing need to do a regional analysis on these laws. Uh, because the longer we wait, more jurisprudence is being created on this. And when I say more jurisprudence, it's really dangerous jurisprudence. Uh, because courts are coming out uh, saying that the internet is dangerous. They're saying the internet is destabilizing uh, political economies. So I think there's really a need to step back and lawyers and as well as um, civil society look at how courts are interpreting these ICT laws. Um, the third point I wanted to make is in relation to religion. And that's been covered in in different panels. But in South Asia, that's certainly the most pressing problem we're facing. Uh, religion and religious sensitivities are being repeatedly used to shut down expression online. Um, this is uh, both expression about religion as well as uh, other forms of expression that are being shut down on the context of it offending religion, as if religion has this concept of information attached to it, which the international uh, mechanisms have been pushing back on. So these are the three broad points uh, I kind of wanted to flag. Hi, uh, my name is Saeed. I come from Afghanistan, a little off west of uh, the, the team today, but I uh, just want to give uh, our perspective. Um, as an ex-government employee, uh, we have some tactics in terms of public uh, public consultation when it comes to cyber law and, 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 and legislation similar to that. Um, so so I, I completely agree with you with, with the approach that government usually, um, they do consult private businesses and, and, and uh, uh, civil society, but they have their own tactics of keeping it minimum and, 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 and quiet. And, and they do that by, in, in my particular case, is that lim they limit the time and they also um, use very um, limited number of publications which are government only and people don't usually read that. Uh, so they still publish that, fine, they, re they <laughs> fulfill the minimum requirement, but who reads that do people get back to them or no? Um, so th that happens, and they, they do it once and twice and thrice, and nobody responds because the channels that you th that they use are, are are the channels that they usually don't even read or, or, or print. they're usually like printed publications which people are not using anymore. Um, another concern that uh, we have in our country is that when I was talking to the director of of, of information security, uh, the directorate drafted the, the cyber law, is that they reduced the age of a minor from 18 to 16. Uh, and that, I think, in itself is such a big challenge of, of targeting minors who are, uh, according to them, they are usually the, the larger number of hackers. Uh, um, that, in itself, is, is a big indication of of criminalization of, of, of people, of, of citizens through these, uh, uh, through these cyber laws and, and not actually protecting them or, or giving education to them or giving an opportunity to, to not repeat the mistakes uh, that they would do uh, again. And I, would, I repeat myself that these are usually, uh, hack, what hackers do usually, they are, they are mistakes and they could uh, probably revert back if they could. Thank you.
answer the both questions. All right, um, ma'am, uh, from South Asia. Uh, believe it or not, Malaysia do have issue with religion. We do have religious fundamentalists uh, making a lot of comment, believe it or not. Uh, here's my opinion on this. It's not a technology problem. In fact, bad news, technology amplify the problem. Uh, to fix it, actually to fix society, to educate people in more civil way to talk. Uh, um, so over there, uh, that, again, is not a tech problem. It's a uh, unique Okay, put it this way, uh, we need better civic communication. The problem is, even in our country, we, um, we do not know any form of consultation on issues as well, any issues. That is actually a common tactic. But how you solve that is, again, groups of people actually try to find out, take time to find out. That's what lobbies does. Unfortunately, we don't have a big team for it, but a lot of countries have the same issues. Again, this is not a technical problem. It's a problem on civil society and the society itself. So, uh, in this case, in your case, uh, the technical solution won't amplify your issue. It, you know, ideally uh, fix it. But again, both of these uh, different scenario is not a tech issue. But in your case, uh, technology gonna make things worse. In your case, it might make things easier. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for uh, the questions and the answers. Thank you for coming to our panel today, and please uh, join me in uh, applauding our panels. Thank you.